let's get started. And I will start by saying welcome and thank you so much to all of you for joining us today as we talk with Jennifer Oliva, CPA and managing partner also at your part-time controller. We are going to talk today about fraud in the nonprofits and also some of the ugly truths that we're going to share. So Jennifer, we're looking forward to, to diving in deep in that conversation here shortly. And before we do that, we of course want to start our episode by saying thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. Sponsors. We are so grateful for their continued dedication and investment in these episodes. Now almost 400 in today's Power Week, of course, and we are just so uh, appreciative to have all of their continued to support for the sector at large. And of course, today, as we start and kick off on this Monday, or as I like to call it, Monday, because Friday gets all the cheer and Monday always gets the womp womp. But we are so <laughs> excited to have this nonprofit Power Week with your part time controller, the nonprofit accounting specialist. So Julia joins me here today. Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom. I'm so privileged to get to play along with Julia every day and our talented episode guest. I'm also known as the nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And again, I want to welcome back uh, with us today, Jennifer Oliva. Jennifer, you have been so paramount to our shows, uh, really, you know, to so many of our episodes in particular around this whole topic of accounting, um, especially as, you know, you are a managing partner uh, there, here, everywhere, because your part-time <laughs> controller serves, serves so many, you know, areas. But you literally have come to us on these episodes with like breaking news, as Julia shared in the Chitty Chat chat. So we are so appreciative to have you back uh, today and then also your team this week. So welcome. Oh, thank you. It's so great to be here. Thanks for having you us know, for the whole week. So exciting. Week. Yeah. For the whole week. And just to give everybody a heads up, we're going to have different experts from your part-time controller joining us talking about different things. And um, it's going to be really exciting. We only get to do a nonprofit power week very rarely. And so this is a big deal for everybody on our teams that we all come together and we, we pose the question, what if we could drill down on something really intensely for that week and pull together all these different thoughts that are kind of moving in the same direction. So Jennifer, we're super excited to have you um, talk about that with us. But the first way, the first thing we want to start about for the week is kind of one of the dirty little secrets, and that's about fraud. Mm -hmm. And I've got to believe that the big shocker is that fraud happens at all in the nonprofit sector. No, so say it ain't so. Well, we'd all love to believe because we're all doing good at all these wonderful nonprofits that this fraud never happens there. But unfortunately, it's not the case. We see it quite often. And matter of fact, the uh, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners did a study in 2020 and found that uh, 191 uh, reported frauds were out there in nonprofit organizations. And I think that's a very low number because many nonprofit frauds go unreported. But there's a lot of losses going on in uh, fraud world out there because in nonprofit world, because $75,000 is the median loss, but the average loss is over $600,000 when a nonprofit does find a fraud. It is, it, it could be enormous for an organization. Now, is that in its longevity or in a year? Like no, I think it's in its longevity. I'll tell you that okay. we uncovered, uh, probably our largest fraud that we uncovered, because often we go in when things are messy at an organization. They, um, the executive director, directors don't know what's going on financially, and they are like, please come in and help us. And then we go in and uncover what's been going on. And we find that, oh, maybe the controller there that has been a longtime person has been cutting checks to himself for a very long time and covering it up to the tune of three quarters of a million dollars. So that's probably the largest one that we found over the years, but there's still so many other schemes that uh, organizations come up with uh, and that go undetected for a long time. So it could add up to big numbers over time. 
Wow. And like you said, the, yes. these are the ones that have been reported. Yes. Um, and we know there's 1.8 million nonprofits in the U.S. Yes. Um, sadly, yes, fraud does happen. I have actually um, come in as an interim CEO of an organization that had just terminated uh, their previous CEO for this exact reason. So Sadly, I too have have seen that firsthand or really, you know, the the after effect of that. How does this even happen? Yeah. Uh, how does fraud happen at organizations? Yeah. I mean, you, you gave this example of yeah. you know, maybe the controller was writing checks to himself. I could even yes. say herself, their self, yes. right? Right. But really then, looking yeah. at like, <laughs> how does this happen? How does something like that go undetected for perhaps yeah. a while? So I'm going to say two words, internal controls, or maybe it's four words, lack of internal controls or <laughs> yes. you know, overriding uh, internal controls. That's three words. So it all has to do with the checks and balances in any organization so that there's uh, support for all the activities in, a, in the financial area that are either being checked on or there's two people that are uh, involved in a process uh, that make it more secure. Uh, in an organization. So you, you, I have three groups of internal controls that uh, are the big ones that we like to focus on at your part-time controller uh, when we teach about internal controls. And those, those are tone at the top, policies and procedures, and segregation of duties. Mm -hmm. So if you want to dig into that a little bit, I, I, I'd love to. Yeah. So let's go backwards and say okay. segregation of duties. Okay. What does that mean? So that means having two people involved in a process uh, that not one person in the organization has control over all of the money where they are perhaps in the accounting system, they are paying bills, they are also reconciling accounts, preparing financial reports, reviewing the financial statements, and no one else is involved in any of that process. I'll tell you, when we work with an organization, oftentimes there's somebody that is doing the transactional work that's involved an employee at the organization. So they would be paying the bills and we highly recommend an electronic bill pay system, okay. not cutting checks anymore because actually electronic bill pay systems are much more secure from an internal control standpoint than regular old check cutting. And there's a, a lot of reasons why. But getting back to this like check checks and balances, so that you know the individual internally will pay the bills electronically, and hopefully there's multiple authorizations for those bill pay. So they're not just authorizing and paying it. The executive director is part of that process, or some other individuals in, is part of in the organization is part of that process. But then somebody else comes in and performs the bank reconciliation so that if something was going awry in the bill paying process, hopefully that would come out in the reconciliation process and in the financial statement preparation process. You know, are there large variances? All of a sudden, oh, a budget amount for marketing was only, you know, $10,000. All of a sudden it's, you know, 20, 30, $40,000. Maybe we ought to look into that. So that's that segregation of duties, having multiple people in the process. Okay, now I got to ask this because we're talking about how fraud can actually happen. And one of the things is, is that, you know, we use volunteers, we're short staffed, we pull in people that might not be the best fit, but they might have like the strongest passion for an organization. And yeah. we're like, okay, they're a live body, they're willing to do it. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that we're looking away improperly or, or do, is that just a what happened? You know, I think it has to do with the attitude from the management and the board as it relates to making sure, even if there's volunteers uh, doing certain activities in the organization, which I don't fully recommend, especially when it comes to the financial part, when they're doing operational activities. But I, I understand some small organization need need to have it. Uh, but it really goes down to comes down to the um, the board. What is their attitude about these um, uh, about internal controls and making sure that these 
checks and balances are in place and that they are exemplifying uh, great ethical behavior so that follows through whether it's employees or volunteers throughout the organization. It kind of, you know, the, it means is the board putting in policies that really are helpful to make sure that fraud can't happen or, or it's, it's uh, less likely to happen. For example, um, we're doing background checks. If even simple as that, even on volunteers that might be involved in any part of the um, process for uh, managing the financials, but background checks are big. Um, also, you know, they have conflict of interest policies for the board because they, you know, also have, they have to show that they are exemplifying great behavior as they want all the employees, the staff, the uh, volunteers to do. So, wow, <laughs> you know, it's a fascinating way to look at this because nobody wants to talk about this ahead of, of time. Yeah. Well, it seems, it seems like we don't want to cast aspersions. It's, it's a delicate thing. I think a lot of us can't even process that this could happen to our organization. Yeah. I and mean, it's, I, it, it's out there. And, uh, you know, I think as a board member, especially, and certainly as an executive director, you have uh, a responsibility to the organization. You have stewardship, um, fiscal responsibility to the organization. And we preach to take that responsibility very seriously and um, making sure that things are in place like uh, credit cards. You know, that's one of the area that areas that really becomes and can, uh, a problem often and can go awry very quickly when there's a lot of organizational credit and debit cards flying around and there's not a lot of oversight, um, checks and balances or any policies surrounding them. And we see that all the time. That's one of the areas um, in, in addition to the uh, you know, check writing schemes that organizations can really get in trouble with. Um, so we always recommend, hey, don't even have company or organizational credit cards. And people are like, are you kidding me? You know, we have to have it, but it's easy enough to have uh, perhaps an expense reporting policy where uh, staff members use their own credit cards and then report it after. You know, there's definitely a need in some organizations to use the credit cards, but they really have to be checked out and, and uh, evaluated and make sure that people are signing off on different approvals of those for sure. Well, and the debit card really makes my heart skip because it's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that is access to the bottom line many times, Absolutely. you know, to the checking account. And that's really scary. Yep. They can dig right into the bank account using a debit card if somebody has that that account uh, number. The other thing is payroll. You know, payroll is one of the areas that we always focus on as a potential for risk in many different ways. So you have uh, you could have a employee. Um, that is not on staff. Uh, at, we call them ghost employees, where someone has access to the payroll records and is able to pay someone that's not on the uh, roster of the organization as a staff member. I uh, can't even fathom that. Yes, yes, that's why you have to have like the executive director should be reviewing payroll registers at, or a designee and you say, oh gosh, that's so onerous. Uh, executive directors are so busy. Do they have time? Yes. Do they, you know, they really either in a smaller organization, they should be doing in a larger organization, perhaps, you know, a designee, uh, someone that uh, they trust and can review the payroll registers that's not part of the payroll process, going back to that segregation of duties. Because what else could go wrong with payroll is somebody just gives themselves a raise and it's just, uh, you know, just goes on for years and years. <laughs> Wow. Is that the same as maybe, you know, I have no idea, but, you know, like vacation time, PTO hours, something like that. Is that also an area that's taken advantage of perhaps if someone does have the controls to. We have not come across that of somebody padding their vacation and okay. especially they, perhaps if they're paying out vacation at the end of the year on used vacation yes. could be an area. Uh, we have not come across it. I can remember uh, a scheme like that. But one thing that uh, we have seen is healthcare coverage. Uh, ineligible family members being added to the healthcare coverage uh, that adds up dollar-wise for the nonprofit organization. Not that easy to find, but it just goes 
to back to is somebody checking that after you know, annual enrollment. Does everybody you know, do we check what's happening with the, uh, uh, with the do they check the bills? Uh, you know the actual invoices that come in to see who is eligible on the plan. Those internal internal controls are so, so, so important. As a consultant, when I notice that the board is, as I would call it, a rubber stamping board, mm -hmm. that gives me alarm um, because it tells me that the board, the executive team has become um, pretty complacent. They're really resting on their laurels and maybe becoming more lax in these controls. Um, and that to me, Jennifer, I don't know if you've seen that or witnessed that, or if, if that's maybe one of your and your team's red flags also is when the board just says, okay, sure. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a red flag. Uh, and we, you know, one of our jobs is board education and we try to educate board members all the time as to their responsibilities and then bring these issues up with board members and with executive teams as far as these policies are lacking here or there. And this is ways you can strengthen them. And quite frankly, if we see a board that is not interested in following the rules of engagement as it relates to internal controls, it's not an organization we necessarily want to work with because we're putting ourselves at risk. That says liability all over it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, yes. part of that, I've got to ask this question and get your opinion on this because I feel like nonprofits are so afraid of looking less than professional than, you know, frightening away their donors and fraud could be one of those areas. And so I can see where there's like a vicious cycle and that fraud happens, but it doesn't get reported mm -hmm. and then it just can actually bloom in other areas. And I'm wondering if you could kind of walk us through that. Yes. I think it, it all comes down to, and that we preach to all of our organization is transparency. Okay. We preach transparency. If a fraud does happen, and I want to talk a little bit too about, we talked a lot about internal fraud, but there's a lot of external uh, forces coming down on organizations that cause fraud too, like cybercrime, uh, phishing schemes, uh, that an organization might get caught up in ac accidentally or <laughs> following an email that says, hey, this is your vendor. Uh, can uh, we change bank accounts? Uh, send, a, send that payment to this bank account, it's new. And then just uh, and staff member at the nonprofit just sends that money right along. So that is another big risk that's really relevant and, and uh, out there for nonprofit organizations and training is really important for, for staff members in that respect. So there could be, could, there could be fraud that comes from an internal uh, process or problem or this external. And either way, we preach like, okay, first we found the fraud. Let's investigate, well, let's let everybody know at the organization, the executive director, the board, um, perhaps their attorney, and come up with a plan as far as identifying what happened, how much is the fraud, and then is there a public relations issue that we need to take out to um, the world and say, hey, this happened and this is what we're doing about it so it won't happen again. We had um, a, an organization that we heard of that had a very large fish, fishing scheme problem, like lost a lot of money because they, act, I say again, accidentally, they sent the money to the vendor uh, and it was the wrong vendor. It was a, you know, a criminal um, and lost a lot of money. And what they did was become very transparent, tell the world, that this happened to us, and guess what? They got a lot more donations uh, oh. that month because they were truthful about it. And I will tell you, the general public does not like to hear about a nonprofit getting duped like that. Right. So right. that is that is I, so transparency from that perspective is was a very good thing for them. The other thing is just really the ethical you know behavior of I don't if somebody inside stole from me. Am I going to let that person go and then potentially go work for another organization and do the same thing to them? 
I mean, it's just uh, not really a great thing to do. So we preach transparency and getting all of those players involved. And it really comes down to a conversation with the board, with the executive team, with uh, attorneys and possibly a, a public relations specialist uh, when you come out with this. But certainly if somebody committed a crime against you, we you know, say, let's let's press charges. I mean, that that is the right thing to do. I wish that is what every organization would decide to do. And I know that that is simply not the case, uh, which really saddens me because as you said, Jennifer, this individual could then do harm and damage elsewhere in the community. And now, because so many of us working remotely from anywhere, right, it's, yes. it really opens up Pandora's box to so many problems. I'm curious, um, you know, you talk a little bit about going public with the fraud and having really this communication plan in place. Do you recommend a forensic audit? And is that something that needs to take place? Often when I was talking about like understanding the number, like how did it happen? Uh, how bad is it? Um, I always say when there's smoke, there's fire. So if we see fraud in one area of an organization, say, with the bill paying process, uh, someone set up a fictitious vendor and was paying that vendor. Then I say, okay, let's look at all the payroll processes. Let's look at the cash receipts process. And oftentimes uh, the board will recommend that a forensic auditor come in and dig through more of the transactions. Often in a smaller organization, I mean, we can help the organization at least understand that we're not fraud examiners or fraud specialists, uh, but understanding uh, the problems in the organization from a transactional standpoint, we can dig through that and give um, some feedback to the organization to see if there's any fire behind any of the other smoke, I guess. <laughs> so now we don't have much time left, but I would, I know that you were on a national panel not too long yes. ago, and you were talking about one of the, the biggest shakeups in yes. terms of a nonprofit and it's still going on. And I'm wondering if you feel comfortable talking about that. Oh, absolutely. We have a, um, a webinar uh, that we recorded uh, a few months ago, I think, called Backfired, Fraud at the NRA, National Rifle Association. Great uh, title, other, by the other, way. <laughs> it's our, it's our ma marketing team. What can I tell you? They are fantastic. Uh, and um, so I encourage uh, everyone to go look at that webinar to hear the background and story about the NRA because it is, you know, certainly a very public um, situation that's going on right now. The Attorney General of New York and of Washington D.C. Uh, uh, started an investigation of the NRA's financial practices and uh, other practices uh, many years ago, probably in 2019. Um, the NRA has refuted uh, many of the, those claims. However, which is very interesting, a couple interesting pieces to this if we have time. So the first interesting piece is that the NRA in uh, an effort to um, get away from the New York uh, laws, uh, tried to declare bankruptcy in the state of Texas. It was very, it seemed like a Hail Mary pass and it was because Texas said, you know, you're not, and I think the purpose was to, try to incorporate then in Texas where they have less restrictive laws around gun control. However, and I don't wanna get into politics of this, this is, has to do with the financial part of things, right, sure, okay? Sure. Uh, but it's so interesting. So the Texas courts knocked that down and said, you you know, no, this is, you can't declare bankruptcy. First of all, you're not really insolvent. Second of all, you're a New York organization. So go back to New York. The second thing that's super interesting is that the NRA, um, although they were refuting many of the allegations uh, of the attorney general office, attorney general's office is, I guess, <laughs> many of them, um, they uh, put out their 2019 990 that laid out a bunch, and it's it's there for the reading, it's out on uh, <laughs> the World Wide Web uh, for anyone who is interested in taking a look at it, but they detailed some of the issues that they said they did their own internal investigation. And yes, there was some overspending by multiple uh, executives, including the, the CEO, and that we're in a process of paying it back or um, there was some 
executives that they were taking issue with that weren't necessarily paying it back. Um, but they said, don't worry about it. Now we put the controls in place that this is never going to happen again. Mm -hmm. So that is just fascinating to me when you talk about going public with your frauds, they really did. But the attorney generals in New York and I believe still Washington are saying, uh, well, thanks for that information. Thanks for admitting it, because it was certainly an admission of certain activities, which was, again, overspending and then also compensation issues uh, that they're investigating. But that's not enough. We're still going to be digging deep into the policies and um, processes at the NRA. So more to follow on that story. It's just... Uh, I think, again, what we teach from that is the tone at the top. Has the uh, board uh, been involved enough in the policies of the organization that the organization does not fall prey to external um, review about their spending by executives and their compensation policy, specifically in this case? And then also there was a whole bunch of, you know, there's allegations of a whole bunch of board conflicts that the board hasn't been completely up and up in this as well. So um, really comes down to that, you know, teaching of from the beginning, boards need to be uh, beyond reproach in their behavior. And then also helping the organization and guiding an organization through um, spending policies, compensation reviews, and making sure the organization itself too is beyond reproach. Wow. You know, and I love that you say, and I we're, we're wrapping up here, but, it, you know, to go public and to be transparent with this tragic event, regardless of when it happened, who did it, you know, is to make that statement. But then as you make that statement to also take the action that needs to be taken to rectify and remedy those internal controls. So Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, I could talk for hours about this mm -hmm. because it is so shocking to me, although I have been involved with an agency that had to truly uh, repair this situation and it is just traumatic. So I appreciate you and really shedding light on fraud in nonprofits and talking about the ugly truth. It does happen, um, but I know your part-time controller is there to safeguard and to ensure that it doesn't happen to your organization. So thank you. That's what we try. So thanks for having me. It's been great. Well, it's such an amazing way and it's a, it's a great way for us to kick off this week because these are the things that we don't talk about, we don't want to think about, but yet they're happening and they just, they're, I think they reveal so much more about our organizations, Jennifer, and what you've been talking about um, has really helped us to kind of understand that. Um, so as we go forward, Jared and I want to say thank you so much. It's going to be a lot of fun to have this nonprofit power week with your part-time controller. Again, thank you to our presenting sponsors who have really jumped on board at this concept. And as I said, this power week is very different because we are going to have every single day, including our Friday Ask and Answer, have a tie back in to accounting and, and the, the financial side of our nonprofit sector, which we know is so, so critical. Part of these discussions are gonna be bankers in your boat and how they work and what you need to do. Financial best practices for boards. I think we got a lot of that today. And it ties really well into today's uh, conversation too. So. Yeah, yeah. Remote accounting. This is such a big thing. We're doing so many things remote. How do we do that? And then of course our ask and answer. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. And again, Jennifer, um, you all, we said this in the Chitty Chat Chat, you are working with more than a thousand nonprofits yes. across this country. We are around, across the country. I think we're in 43 states uh, now, mm -hmm. going for the 50 and beyond. So yes. Wow. And, and <laughs> as, you know, really the largest uh, financial uh, accounting controlling uh, service for our nonprofit sector. Yes. I mean, we're, we're uh, 
325 strong on our team. And all we do is accounting for nonprofit organizations. And uh, that's our focus and our love because we love working with the sector. Uh, it's very meaningful work for all of the team members that we have. Uh, they are accountants with a purpose. So, uh, so can I, plug, can I plug our website? Yes, of course. <laughs> YPTC.com. So please visit that. And then also have one other plug to make. Yeah. Uh, we just recently started this year a, our own podcast, our own video podcast called Mission Business, uh, uh, where we are talking about organizations mission and then with a focus on their financial practices and their business. So uh, we have three uh, episodes out and uh, very many more to come. And uh, fraud is going to be a big topic coming up too. So look out for that. Awesome. Well, we love it. We are so excited to venture forward uh, with you all and your amazing team at YPTC. Um, we really have enjoyed working with you from the very beginning. And, and as many of you will recall, Jennifer really was one of our first guests that we had on when all of this went down almost two years ago. And so this is, I know you're like, what? But mm -hmm. this has been really, really exciting. Hey, as we start this amazing week, we want to remind everyone once again, stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow. <laughs>